Welcome to the first webinar in the series, Come Together Right Now, conversations about the natural world, environmental policy changes, and how we can bring back a healthy planet. My name is Lori Schneider. I'm the Executive Director for Pollinator Friendly Alliance, and it's our honor to be joined tonight by two conservation heroes, Chris Helzer, Nature Conservancy's Director of Science at Nebraska, and Rick Hansen, Minnesota State Representative. After Chris's talk, there'll be a short Q&A with a chat, and after Rick's talk, we'll provide you with some resources and links, so please stick around. Tonight's program is brought to you by Pollinator Friendly Alliance, with support from our friends at Bear Honey a local apiary and honey company that does work for good. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots nonprofit that protects the natural world. This series of webinars aim to educate about the natural world and inspire people to take action. We can use our voices to protect planet Earth. PFA is driven by the power of volunteers and our partners. Some of you may wonder what pollinator conservation has to do with environmental policy changes. The pollinators are a keystone species in a very interconnected web of life, which all depend upon the other. Climate change, loss of habitat and biodiversity have direct impacts on pollinators, birds, other wildlife, and the entire planet ecosystem. We've been warned for 40 years of climate change by scientists and environmentalists and how lack of biodiversity will bring on human disease. Biodiversity is as central to all life as oxygen and water. If you're here with us tonight, I'm certain you're well aware our planet is in crisis. I grew up with the camping motto, leave it better than you found it. And a father who took me along on his quest to save the rivers. I made a spiritual deal to do my best and hardest work to be a protector of the natural world and the sentient beings that live here. We are all the protectors. As human beings, sometimes we separate ourselves from nature, like nature is a commodity, but we are part of it. We all share this planet and one big blue sky. With the historic and devastating fires in the West and hurricanes in the Gulf, these times are difficult for people and for the natural world. Over the last three years, more environmental policies have been dismantled than ever before at a time when the planet needs critical help. Regulations and rules protecting the environment have been deemed unnecessary and burdensome and in the way of fossil fuel industry and other businesses. As the president makes way for his America First energy plan, Here's a short list of just some of the environmental policy rollbacks. So now is the time. We have a chance to launch a new era that starts in our communities and includes all of us to save the planet. During the pandemic, we witnessed the results of ignoring scientists and truths. We can't afford to let elected officials make the same mistakes with the environment. Our work and voice are more critical now than ever to protect these things that we love. So I'm now gonna hand it over to our feature speaker tonight who will beautifully illustrate some of the little things that run the world and that we love about this place. Chris Helzer is a dynamic speaker, a talented photographer, a longtime ecologist and conservationist, he authored two books on ecology and nature and produces the popular blog, Prairie Ecologist. His published photographs and writings are a source of inspiration. Hi, Chris. Hello there. Are you ready to launch? I'll I'm ready. 
I'll stop sharing. All right, does that look good? Well, um, hi everybody, thanks for coming. And I'm gonna talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, and if you think of questions, please put them in the chat. We'll get to as many as we, as we can. Um, Lori said if there's extras, I can, she'll send them to me and I'll try to answer them via email if I can too. So I wanna start by talking about prairies at the large scale. Um, I live in Nebraska where we have the Nebraska Sandhills, which is about 12 million acres of contiguous grassland. We're really fortunate. There are not, not a lot of places like that left in the world. And prairies do function at a large scale really well, but even at a large scale, a lot of what happens that's important happens at a smaller scale, and it's the details that matter a lot of the time. And when people think about nature, they tend to think about large charismatic animals like deer or bison, uh, or maybe birds, either game birds um, or just little songbirds. But if even with songbirds, if you look at them and then look up close, uh, there are smaller things going on that are also important. If you look at the organisms on the earth and in our ecosystems, vertebrates make up a really small proportion uh, number wise. And it's not that they're not important, but the plants and invertebrates, and then I could make this even larger, right, with microorganisms of all kinds below that. Um, plants and invertebrates really make up the bulk of the species that we think about in terms of function of an ecosystem. And that diversity of species leads to a diversity of functions and a redundancy of functions between them. And that's what makes up ecological resilience. And ecological resilience is basically a way of thinking about the adaptive capacity, the, the ability of an ecosystem or a natural area to adapt to whatever happens to it and maintain its function, its productivity, its diversity, and everything that makes it uh, what we'd like it to be. So we're gonna talk a lot about species diversity and I wanna start with sunflowers. And I wanna start with sunflowers because I don't know about Minnesota or the other states that people might be from. In Nebraska, we have nine different species of sunflower. Uh, seven of those are perennials, two of them are annuals. Uh, those are the native species that we have. And there's a whole lot of other species that kind of look like sunflowers and provide a lot of the same uh, sort of resources that sunflowers do. And sunflowers are important for a lot of species. So here's a, here's a longhorn bee, for example, one of our native bees that specializes on sunflowers. So it feeds primarily on sunflowers. There are lots of other species that also feed on sunflowers, getting the pollen and nectar out of them. And sunflowers make that really easy because they, they literally put them on a platter. So pollen and nectar is available to anybody. It's not like some species of flowers where you have to be a certain size or have a tongue length that fits into the flower, or you can, or you know, you have to be a size that you can fit into the flower, or you have to be strong enough to wrestle the flower open, which is the case with a lot of the uh, sort of pea family flowers. Sunflowers just put it right out there for you. So they attract a lot of insects, which also attracts a lot of predators who are there to take advantage of the fact that there are a lot of insects drawn to sunflowers. One of the ways that sunflowers also draw insects and, and provide resources is they have what's called extra floral nectar, which is a kind of a sweet substance that they produce outside of the, the front of the flower where you think about nectar being produced. And in a lot of cases, there are insects that, that will pick up on that. Ants are one example of that. We'll actually talk about this again later, but ants are drawn, they have a sweet tooth, they're drawn to that. And sunflowers can essentially buy protection by bringing these predators to themselves to help protect, protect against herbivores. But uh, the number of ants that come also uh, is a benefit to the, the predators that are waiting there for them. Sunflowers also produce really big seeds, very nutritious seeds. There's a reason we use them in bird feeders or for, for feeding ourselves even. Um, and so that's a really valuable resource for, for wildlife species of a lot of different kinds. The other thing about sunflowers, and this is especially true with annual sunflowers, but they are able to respond quickly when the rest of the ecosystem and the prairie ecosystem is stressed. So this is an example from the Nature Conservancy's Niobrara Valley Preserve up in the Sandhills of Nebraska. 
in 2012, there was a big summer wildfire that came through in the middle of the worst single year drought in recorded history. Uh, and it stressed the prairie ecosystem, not in a way that really caused huge problems because prairies are pretty resilient to fire and drought, but in a way that, uh, you know, a lot of the regular wildflowers and grasses didn't do very well in 2013, but what helped fill that gap was annual sunflowers. This is the plains sunflower, and it just exploded all over the place the year following. Filled in, provided a lot of resources when other plants were not able to. Another thing about the diversity of sunflowers that really is help helpful and handy is that no matter where you are on the landscape, uh, topography-wise, moisture-wise, even sun versus shade, there are different sunflowers that might be available for you, which is nice now because anywhere you can go, you'll probably find a sunflower. But also with climate change, as conditions continue to change on the landscape, uh, these sunflowers will be able to move around and as conditions get wetter or drier or hotter or cooler, uh, there will always still be a sunflower available for the species that rely on it. So let's change gears and talk about milkweed. Everybody's paying attention to milkweed right now for a variety of reasons, but largely because of monarch butterflies. And when you think about milkweed, you probably think about these big pink flowered plants. But you know, in Nebraska, at least, there are 17 different kinds of milkweed, many different colors and shapes and sizes. And that's true in most other places. And milkweed's important for a variety of pollinators, um, including bumblebees and butterflies, including the regal fritillary butterfly shown here, which is a prairie specialist, but also things like little bee flies and wasps of multiple kinds. And just like sunflowers, when you attract lots of insects to feed on pollen or nectar, you attra attract uh, predators as well including another crab spider here that caught a fly that was attracted to uh, this milkweed plant. And then that's just the flowers, right? So milkweed provide leaves and stems for, for insects to eat, but because of the latex that the milkweed produces, it's a toxic substance of that white sticky stuff. Uh, there are, it's a, there's a restricted number of species that can feed on milkweed, but those species rely on them uh, and tend to specialize on that plant. So things like the longhorn milkweed beetle or the large milkweed bug are adapted to being able to deal with that latex, which provides them a resource that's not available to a lot of other insects. Uh, so that's important to them, and that's why they can specialize and feed just on these plants. And they can feed on, again, a variety of the different milkweed species. So pollinators and these herbivores uh, don't rely specifically on one kind of milkweed, they rely on multiples, and that's important uh, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Here's a non-native species that also adapts well to milkweed. This is uh, the oleander aphid that has uh, done very well since it's found in North America's milkweed populations. So let's talk about monarchs just for a second, because again, this is why a lot of people are paying attention to milkweed, and that's good. Um, but monarchs also, the as caterpillars, need milkweed, but they can use a lot of different kinds of milkweed species, and that's important uh, because it provides some redundancy and helps make sure that they have milkweed when they need it. There was a really good example of this a couple of years ago in Nebraska. So where we're at in the migratory pattern of monarchs is that the monarchs that are leaving Nebraska now will go to Mexico and then in spring they'll return from Mexico into the southern part of the U.S. and typically they make it somewhere in Arkansas, for example, southern part of the U.S. or Texas or Oklahoma the lay eggs there, and then the next generation is the one that we see up in Nebraska. And I think that's true up in Minnesota as well. So typically we see monarchs show up, but up in May, it's the second generation out of Mexico. But in 2017, uh, it was a really early start to the year. And we had monarchs showing up in April that had come all the way from Mexico. And you could tell that because they were faded like this one is here. You could tell they'd had a long, rough life, uh, having migrated all the way south and then all the way back north. And they were really looking for anything they could eat. And dandelions uh, covered a lot of their, their food needs when they arrived because there was not a lot else blooming yet. And then they were desperate to lay eggs. But the problem was the common and showy milkweed species that they are typically, uh, or that they typically favor were either not out of the ground or if they had emerged from the ground, they got frozen back. So they really weren't available. Fortunately, we have 17 different kinds of milkweed in Nebraska and one of them, world milkweed, is a little bit more cold tolerant. It was doing great. 
um, it was growing strongly. And so that's the species that carried monarchs through that, that unexpectedly early season. So here you can see a monarch egg, you can see a monarch caterpillar, and you can actually see, if you look carefully, you can see the egg of a parasite <laughs> that laid its egg on the monarch caterpillar, because parasites have to live too. But world milkweed is what saved monarchs, uh, that generation of monarchs, basically. And if we had only had one or two species of, of milkweed, uh, they would both froze off and monarchs would have been in big trouble. But that redundancy really was helpful. So let's talk about some more pollinators. And when you talk about pollinators, bees uh, cover the bulk of the work uh, in a lot of ecosystems. There's a lot of reasons that bees are important that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on. But I also wanna make sure that we talk about bees separate from honeybees. So here's a honeybee. Honeybees are non-native. They're a livestock species basically we brought to the US. Nothing wrong with honeybees, they're great. But honeybees are not the, the workhorse of the ecosystem pollinator, right? So most wildflowers uh, and native plants don't get a lot of benefit out of honeybees. Um, and there are a lot of native bees that need to fill in there. So if you wanna save the earth, uh, honeybees are probably not our, our savior. But again, if you like honey and there's a lot of good things that honeybees do, that's great. But I wanna talk about the diversity of native bees that's out there. And I wanna start with bumblebees. In Nebraska, we have 20 different species of bumblebees. I'm sure it's a very similar number other, in other states where you guys are. Uh, there's a lot of diversity there. Bumblebees are really important. And they do have, like honeybees, they have a, a queen and a worker uh, social system that's built up around that, that queen. But the vast majority of bees in the country are not uh, social. They don't have those queen worker systems. Uh, and there are lots of them. You know, in each state, there might be four or 500 different kinds of species of bees. Uh, in the North American continent, we're talking about more like 5,000 or more species of native bees. And they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. And so, like I talked about earlier, flowers have different adaptations for different kinds of bees, different sizes of bees, tongue lengths, all those sorts of things. So having a large diversity of bees is really important in terms of making sure that all the flowers out there get the kind of pollination services that they need. And most of these bees being non-social, they're called solitary bees. Uh, they have a single mom who is in charge of her own nest. She builds her nest, either digs a hole in the ground or finds a hollow stem and stacks up eggs uh, in little cells. She, she lays an egg, she goes, gets pollen and nectar, mixes it together often in kind of a little dough ball sticks it in there with the egg and seals that up in a cell so that when the egg hatches, the larva has enough food to grow to adulthood and then, and then leave the nest. But the mom is doing that all by herself. Uh, the males fly around flowers waiting for females to come by to mate with, but the, the females are doing the work. And if they're not out getting food or laying eggs or provisioning food for their, for their babies, they're in the nest defending it from a lot of other predators and other things that are gonna uh, cause a threat to it. This is an example of a bee that is a specialist that feeds only on this species of flower. This is the blue sage bee, which feeds primarily or exclusively, I mean, on either blue sage or pitcher sage, different names of the same plant. But that's unusual. Most bees are not that specialist. You know, you can have some like that sunflower bee I mentioned earlier that specialize uh, on sunflowers, but they can eat from a lot of different kinds of sunflowers. But a lot of other bees are pretty generalist and they'll feed on whatever is most available and most nutritious at the time. What that means is that plant diversity is really important because throughout the season, bees are going to be switching from one species to another species to another species of plants. And if they're going to make it through their entire season, which for some of them is the entire growing season, uh, there's got to be a lot of different species of plants to make sure there's always something blooming. And a lot of bees have a restricted distance from their nests that they can fly because of usually because they're very small. And so if you look at a landscape from the bee's perspective, this is, I think, I find this really helpful as a land manager, but I think just in terms of understanding ecosystems, this is useful. But think about a little tiny hole in the ground where there's a, a female bee that has a nest. And around that hole, there's a radius that she can fly uh, where she can go out and get food and return to the nest. And for some species, it could be as few, as little as 50 or 100 meters. It's not a big area. And that's the entire universe for that bee. So within that circle, throughout the entire season that that adult bee is out trying to, trying to get that nest going, uh, 
there's got to be flowers blooming and, and resources provided. If there's a gap in there, that bee is done and that nest is goes away. Probably nothing happens, but the predators get it or something. Uh, so it's really important to have plant diversity spread out across the landscape so that it, wherever these circles are, there are consistent resources being provided all throughout, all throughout the season. Okay, I want to talk about flies. Uh, <laughs> flies are an amazingly diverse group of insects. In fact, in North America, there's an estimated uh, 61,000 species of flies. And I want to repeat that and emphasize that because 61,000 species of flies is a lot. How many can you name? Right now, to yourself, name as many kinds of flies as you can. If you can get above five or six, you're really impressive. But there are 61,000 species out there. And some of them are really large, like this great big black horse fly that's almost an inch in length. Some of them are really, really tiny, like this little one with a white abdomen. And here's an even smaller one uh, on, the, on an Indian grass stem, which you wouldn't notice without, you know, a microscope almost. A lot of bees, or a lot of flies, excuse me, are pollinators. Um, here's one that's feeding on the pollen of Indian grass. Here's one that looks a lot like a bee. And some, some of the pollinating flies do look a lot like bees. They can be hard to tell apart. If you look at the antenna, usually flies have much shorter antenna, little stubby antenna, and much larger eyes than bees have. If you're really good, you can count wings, and flies only have two, where bees have four, but that's really hard to see in the field usually. Here's a, a plant called pussy toes, which is a little early season flower, and here's three different kinds of flies that were feeding on that same uh, species of, of flower on the same day. There's a bee fly, like this one, I showed this one earlier on milkweed too, but bee flies have this real stiff proboscis that always sticks out in front of them, and they can hover in front of a flower and stick that in and get nectar out, uh, or they can land on a sunflower like this because sunflowers, again, make it pretty easy for them. Here's a picture wing fly that looks like it's wearing a gas mask. Here's a crane fly that looks like a giant mosquito. Here's an actual mosquito because mosquitoes are a kind of fly. So within the order Diptera, there are lots and lots of mosquito species that fit into that uh, fly category. And then here's a robber fly. Robber flies are amazing predators. Uh, this one's holding a little leaf hopper. If you, if you look closely, there's a leaf hopper impaled on its long black mouth, be, mouth part there. Robber flies are aerial predators where they'll, they'll take off off a perch or off the ground, knock something out of the ground. They'll inject it with venom that, that paralyzes it, liquefies the interior, and then it can suck the juices out of it basically. Um, and they're really good at catching lots of, lots of prey of different sizes. In fact, here's one that caught a uh, cicada that was several times its own size. Uh, I actually heard this happen. I didn't see it happen. I heard it happen. I heard a cicada take off from my feet as I was walking through the prairie with my daughter. And then it stopped very suddenly, which was weird. So we walked over to see if we could find it. And sure enough, this robber fly had knocked it out of the ground. And then it had to search for a, a way to get through the armor and apparently right where you see that black mouth part going in, that's the seam in the armor. If you ever need to inject something into a cicada, <laughs> that's apparently the place to do it. And here's a different kind of robber fly uh, that you wouldn't know is a robber fly unless you look really closely. This is a robber fly that's a bee mimic. It's a bumblebee mimic. And imagine this poor little beetle who was flying to a flower, uh, probably to, to grab some pollen off of it. And Maybe on that flower, it saw a bumblebee, which it thought, you know, bumblebees, that's no problem. I see bumblebees all the time on flowers. They never bother me. And that was probably the last thought that went through its head before this robber fly injected it with paralyzing, liquefying venom. This is a little long-legged fly, which you wouldn't think of as a predator, but it is. And it feeds on things like ants and other small creatures. So there's 61,000 species of flies. Uh, I talked a lot about the pollinators and the predators, but a lot of them are parasitoids or parasites. There are um, a lot of them as, as larvae especially, but even some adults feed on rotting material and help us on decomposing. They play a whole range of different roles in the ecosystem. And because there are so many of them, if something bad happens to one or two species in a particular year, there are lots of others to kind of carry the weight and fill in, in the gaps while that species is having a tough year. So I want to switch to grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are fascinating creatures that often have a bad reputation, which is too bad because they're, they're, uh, they're not the sort of evil grass munching machines I think that people uh, often think of. Uh, 
And in Nebraska, there's 108 species of grasshoppers. There's Western states tend to have a little bit more diversity than Eastern states, but even in Eastern states, there are a lot of grasshopper species out there. And they come in all different shapes and colors and sizes, just like bees do. Um, and they have different specializations in terms of what they eat. Some of them are very generalist and they'll eat lots of different kinds of plants. Some specialize only on grasses or only on wildflowers or only on the certain set of those wildflowers or grasses. They have complex communication techniques that they use or they use sound, they use visuals. Um, look at the amazing stripes on the, the antenna of this one. This is an olive green grasshopper. It's got spots on its eyes and stripes on its uh, antenna and little streaks all over its body. Just a gorgeous little grasshopper. Some of them are pretty plain brown. Uh, and some of them are just gorgeous. So here's one that this is a, the largest grasshopper in our state, in Nebraska. This is the Plains Lubber. It can be the size of a mouse. And the wing is the little salmon colored with black spots wing there. That clearly is not big enough to carry this grasshopper, right? This is a full grown adult grasshopper, which means it has full, so full sized wings, but it's a flightless species. So it hops around, it jumps around and crawls around. It does not fly. But it's an amazing looking species that really does act a lot like the mouse. Uh, as it crawls and jumps around the landscape and feeds on on uh, mostly wildflowers, I believe, if I remember right. And then this might be the prettiest grasshopper I know of, which is called the painted grasshopper, or there's other names for it. Um, but the stripes on this, and this is another flightless grasshopper, you can see this little tiny wings there. Uh, just an amazing grasshopper that we find out here in the western, in western grasslands. Some of the grasshoppers are really well camouflaged. Uh, and some are specialized, like I said earlier, and this is one that has both. This is the sagewort grasshopper, which feeds almost exclusively on, on sagewort or white sage, cudweed sagewort, other names for that plant. But look at the amazing camouflage of this. Look at the, the not only the color, but the speckles, right? So the, the modeling on its face and body looks just like the sort of the modeling on that plant. Um, Great camouflage, you'll never see them unless you walk past the plant and you sort of kick them up out of the plant as they, as they hop away, you can get to see them. Here's a toothpick grasshopper that's also really well camouflaged. You can, I mean, not only the antenna and the shape of the head, but even the little streak there that mimics the other uh, kind of streaks in that dead grass that it's sitting on. And then the bandwing grasshoppers are maybe the most uh, well known for their camouflage. They like bare ground and they look like bare ground. And in, while they're sitting still, they're awfully hard to pick up. The way you notice them is you walk past and they fly up in the air and they have these really colorful wings with a band on them, which is where band wing grasshopper names come from. And they make this really loud clacking sound. So they sort of make up for being visible by, by startling you as a predator, uh, because that's what they probably think you are. They startle you and hopefully that's enough that they can get away and then land someplace on bare ground where you don't see them again. They just sort of melt back into the background. And then grasshoppers, I'll go back to this picture. Grasshoppers have short antenna. That's what makes them grasshoppers rather than katydids. Katydids have antenna that are as long as their body or longer usually. Um, and they are very similar to grasshoppers in some ways, but also very different in other ways. Um, they feed on a lot of the same kinds of things, but, but in addition to the long antenna, one other big difference is that if you look at the elbow of this grasshopper and you see the little hole there in the elbow, that's the ear. That's what. That's how katydids hear. They hear right out of that little hole in their elbow. Grasshoppers uh, actually hear out of little little holes on the sides of their bodies. But uh, so there are some some fairly big differences in the physical makeup of these two species or these two groups of species. But they also are in the same uh, sort of general group of insects. And both katydids and grasshoppers are, are very, very important food sources uh, for a lot of wildlife species. So here's a little grasshopper sparrow eating a grasshopper, but it's not named for that. It's named for its song, which sounds like a buzzing, buzzing grasshopper. But it's an example of a lot of different wildlife species that rely on grasshoppers because they're big, they've got a lot of protein in them, uh, they're easy to catch, they're very, very abundant. So they're an important food source. And again, because there's a lot of different species, Grasshoppers don't have to, or grasshopper sparrows and other birds don't have to just worry about one species of grasshopper. Whatever's close uh, that happens to be around, they can feed on. And grasshoppers are notoriously cyclical in their populations. So when some grasshoppers are having a bad year, others are having a really good year.
And speaking of that, there are some grasshopper species that are pests. In Nebraska, there are about five or six that can cause real problems, both in croplands and grasslands, just because they get their populations grow so large. They take advantage of monocultures, especially that we provide for them, like cornfields, but even some in, in native prairies. They can do, uh, they can eat a lot very quickly. But again, they're cyclical, so it's not an every year thing. Uh, and they make up a very small minority of the overall grasshopper community. Last thing on grasshoppers is I have a favorite statistic, uh, not even a statistic, it's more of a trivia fact. But if you went out into a prairie and you took all the bison or all the cattle that were in that prairie, they, if they were appropriately stocked, right, if they were the carrying capacity for that prairie, if you took all those bison or cattle and you put them on a scale, and you took all the grasshoppers in that same prairie and put them on the other side of the scale, they would balance out. In other words, the biomass of bison or cattle is the same as the biomass of, of grasshoppers in a prairie. That's an awful lot of grasshoppers. But because they eat a lot of different things and they provide, I mean, from a damage standpoint, they're usually not significant. And from a food standpoint, they're incredibly significant. But that kind of puts it into perspective, right? That that's how many uh, grasshoppers are. And that's, I mean, grasshoppers are one of many kinds of invertebrates that are in prairies. This actually, this equation or this trivia fact actually works with ants too. If you took all the ants in that same prairie, uh, they would weigh the same as either the grasshoppers or the bison. Okay, now if you are worried about grasshopper populations, I'm going to go back to this bee fly for the third time in this talk already. Bee flies as larvae feed on grasshoppers, uh, on the eggs of grasshoppers. So what a bee fly will do is They'll fly around when they're ready to lay eggs and they'll look for a grasshopper that's also laying eggs. And grasshoppers lay eggs into the ground. So they stick their rear end into the ground and they deposit their eggs in a little tunnel in the ground. Bee flies will hover above that tunnel where the grasshopper is laying its eggs and it'll flick its own eggs onto the ground nearby. And when its larvae hatch, the larvae crawl down into the hole where the grasshopper eggs are and they eat them all up. So if you're not a big grasshopper fan, you should be a bee fly fan because you're on the same team. Speaking of eating things up, I want to talk about predators a little bit because predators are really an important part of ecosystems to help regulate numbers uh, and they control diversity. If, if some herbivores or other part of the, the invertebrate population gets out of control, uh, they can really become dominant and take resources away from everybody else and you lose diversity. And again, if you lose diversity, that hurts our overall resilience. So spiders are a great place to start with invertebrate predators anyway. Uh, a lot of them are web weavers. Uh, they all make silk, but not all of them make webs. So there are a lot of free living sort of hunting grasshoppers, many of which are well camouflaged, and they just sort of run around and try to catch prey without having to be stuck on a net or a web, I mean. Here's another one that's camouflaged in two ways, both color and just the way it can sit and sort of blend into a piece of grass. Some of them, like crab spiders, are ambush predators where they sit on a flower or someplace else, but often on a flower, uh, waiting for something to get close enough that they can grab them with their long front legs. And then they do the same thing that robber flies do, where they inject, inject them with venom that paralyzes, liquefies them, and then they can then suck the insides out, basically. And spiders, I know, are not the favorite uh, of many people, but they are so fascinating. Uh, this is a really large female wolf spider. And if you look at those large black hairs, the stiffer hairs coming off of her legs there, those are sensory hairs that she can use to identify what kind of animal is nearby, whether it's prey or not, how it's moving, where it's moving. She can do that in the dark. Um, uh, they're just um, amazing creatures. Another quick trivia fact that you may or may not know is that when any spider walks, uh, its leg is extending with hydraulic pressure. So it has muscles that contract its legs, that, that pull its legs toward, it, toward its body, but if it extends its leg, it's doing that with, with hydraulic pressure. It pumps liquid into its leg to do that. So when you walk a spider or watch a spider walk along and maybe it looks a little stilted or a little jilty, uh, that's why, because it's, it's not using muscles like we use. And then think about jumping spiders and spiders that can jump a long way. Doing that through hydraulic pressure makes it even more interesting that they can do that. But wolf spiders are a great example of, of a kind of spider that's a really good parent. Here's another female wolf spider with her egg sac that she carries around with her uh, from the time that she lays the eggs and bundles, bundles them together until they hatch. And then when they hatch, 
she carries them around for a while longer on her back. So here's a mom with a bunch of her kids. And if you think you have your uh, hands full with kids, uh, imagine wolf spiders. And I want to end on the spiders with the jumping spider, which is my absolute favorite spider because it's the cute little cuddly teddy bear of the spider world. There are lots of different kinds of jumping spiders. Uh, a lot of times you'll find them running around on the side of a building, hunting flies, where they'll, they'll sit quietly until something comes up close or they'll creep a little bit. And when they jump, they have a safety line that they use, a little string of silk that uh, if they happen to miss or fall, they, they're basically attached to their safety line. They can crawl back up to where they were if they get knocked off. And uh, all of my kids are required to play with jumping spiders that we find in our yard. Uh, they're a lot of fun to play with and they're completely harmless, as are most other spiders. And then uh, ants, I already talked about a little bit, but ants are amazing predators that hunt in packs, basically. If you see a really fuzzy caterpillar like this, uh, we think that this is an adaptation at protecting itself against ants and probably other predators, but probably especially ants, uh, because soft-bodied caterpillars are a big prey, prey source or prey item for, for ants. Uh, we already talked about their sweet tooth, and in addition to extra floral nectar, they are also attach, are attracted to aphids, and some of them, it's called farming aphids or uh, ranching aphids, I think makes more sense, but they'll find a colony of aphids that's feeding on a plant, and those little aphids, as they feed on the juice of the plant, exert juice out their back that's very sweet, and the uh, ants will come around and tap the back of an aphid and eat that, it's called honeydew, uh, honeydew is what they call the sweet substance that comes out of the rear end of, a, of an aphid. Um, and, but in addition to feeding on that honeydew, they also protect the aphids from other predators, including things like ladybugs. Um, other predators, this is a tiger beetle, which feeds in, in big open areas and chases down its prey. It also looks a lot like a movie alien, I think. And some of them are incredibly well, are incredibly beautifully colored. Here's a really gorgeous one that got caught by a robber fly, just to tie robber flies back in, because I really like robber flies. And then another predator, uh, here's an assassin bug feeding on a wasp. Here's an ambush bug, which is similar to assassin bugs, closely related, but better camouflaged usually, a little shorter and stockier, but they have a, a similar sort of long proboscis that they inject venom into their prey with. And then there are aerial predators, like dragonflies and damselflies, and then there are sort of the, uh, the big uh, predators that most people are really familiar with, uh, which are the praying mantises. Praying mantises, the, the biggest ones that we see tend to be the Chinese or the, or the European mantises, which are both non-native, unfortunately, and they, they can actually have some negative impacts on ecosystems. So if you see one that's three or four inches long, that's probably a Chinese mantis like this one which can be multiple different colors. They can be green, they can be brown, they can be green and brown. If you see a big one that has a, a armpit spot that's black with a white center, that's the European mantis, which can also get pretty big. But if you see a smaller one where the wings are a lot smaller than the body, even when they're full size, they tend to be real mottled. They can be either green or brown. This is the native Carolina mantis. Um, and they're just as charismatic uh, and fun to play with and look at as the big ones but they don't get as big uh, and they're native. So I mentioned the mantises can be kind of a problem. Uh, and the reason for that is they eat whatever they can catch uh, and they don't inject them with venom. They just basically eat their faces off and then, and then eat the rest of them. And sometimes they can catch pretty large prey. Um, here's a European mantis that caught a uh, large sphinx moth. Some of those big mantises can catch things like hummingbirds even, they're really big. So they were, they were introduced as pest control because they will eat pest insects, but they eat, they eat a lot of beneficial insects too. So that kind of comes out as a wash. Uh, and overall, it's probably something we wish we hadn't, hadn't done. So as a whole, predators, again, they regulate the numbers of other invertebrates and, and sometimes other species and keep anything from getting out of hand where they start to reduce diversity and reduce resilience. So they're a really important part of the community. And I'm not talking about parasites and parasitoids, but really they have the same role, right? They're helping to control numbers of everything else around them. And I wanna finish up, uh, well, not quite finished up, but we're getting close. 
I want to talk about migratory insects because I don't think people think about migratory insects apart from maybe monarch butterflies. But there are a lot of other insects, including other butterflies that are migratory. There are a lot of dragonflies that we find out are long distance migrants like green darners or variegated meadow, meadow hawks that are coming through this area right now. Um, a lot of moths are migratory uh, and are very purposeful about where they're going and how they get there and they can go to a certain uh, elevation above the ground and find the wind current that they need to go, that they need to, to, to go where they want to go. Um, I mentioned other butterflies. This is painted lady butterfly, which is a species that in North America comes out of the desert southwest every year and sort of invades the rest of the country and then flies back to the desert southwest in the fall. And then there are things like this, where like a large milkweed beetle, or large milkweed bugs, excuse me, doesn't look like a species that you would think would be migratory, but they are. Uh, and at least a large proportion of uh, large milkweed bugs every fall fly south and then they return again the next spring. I do want to talk about thistles because thistles tend to be unpopular plants, even though uh, a lot of them are native, at least in Nebraska, we half of our native, our, our species of thistles are native. And for us, and I think this is true in most parts of the Great Plains and Midwest, if you see the bottom of the leaf is really bright white, um, that's a native species. Even the non-native ones provide a lot of resources for pollinators, including this regal fritillary uh, pair of butterflies. Uh, we have a species in Nebraska, one of our natives, that's not even a pink flower. It's a kind of a creamy colored flower and provides a lot of resources for pollinators like bumblebees. This time of year when, when monarchs are migrating through, um, native tall thistles are one of the best resources. I, I see more monarchs on tall thistle than just about any other plant this time of year. In addition, thistles have a lot of other resources. They have big seeds, which are valuable for birds and other wildlife. And at least one species of bird is tightly tied to thistles, which is the goldfinch. An American goldfinch will nest, uh, not often in a thistle like this, or not always in a thistle like this, but this one happened to, but they'll time their nesting a little bit later in the season so that they can feed the, the sort of the tender seeds being produced by thistles to their babies. They also a lot of times will line the nest with the, the thistle fluff uh, from the seeds as they go to seed, or the flowers as they go to seed. Thistles also have an interesting adaptation where they, uh, for their, the bracts, the sort of the underside of the flower is very sticky, almost like flypaper sticky. And what it often catches is ants, which might be uh, on purpose, not on purpose, it might be what the adaptation has evolved for uh, or might not, it might just be an unfortunate thing for ants, but it probably is a protective strategy from something trying to crawl up from the ground, either to steal nectar or to steal seeds. And it's interesting to look at the bottom of thistles. If, you're not, if you haven't done this before, uh, if you start paying attention, it's crazy the number of things that you see that get caught and die, including this male bee on the right side that doesn't have its own home, and so it'll just roost on, on the underside of a plant where it seems safe. And this one roosted there and then never got away, in addition to these couple of ants. And I've even seen, seen things as big as cicadas that have gotten stuck and died on the side of a, of a thistle plant. Okay, so I do want to end now with two of my favorite insect species, just because they have fascinating stories. And it's not that they have more fascinating stories necessarily than others, but uh, I happen to know them. Uh, the first one is an oil beetle. Oil beetles are a kind of uh, blister beetle. Blister beetles make, have, have a yellow substance that comes out of them that really does cause blisters. You don't want to pick them up and give them a hug. Uh, but if, you, if you're gentle with them, they're, they're pretty harmless. But oil beetles have an additional adaptation that's just pretty cool. Uh, their larvae go through multiple stages. And at the first stage of a larva that comes out of an oil beetle egg is tiny and very mobile. And they cluster together. And then they also, they emit a chemical into the air that is the same smell as a female bee, which is pretty interesting because what it does is it attacks or it attracts a male bee to this little cluster of larva. And the male bee is so excited that it thinks it, it smells a female bee and its only job in, in the world is to mate with female bees that it comes and lands on top of this cluster of little larvae, which immediately crawl up on top of the bee. And then you've got a very disappointed male bee that flies off with a bunch of little hitchhikers on it. When it finds a female bee that's a real female bee, it'll mate with that female bee 
those little hitchhikers jump onto the female bee and they ride that female bee back to her nest. And then where they hop off and they go down into the nest and they eat all the eggs and all the larvae that might be there, in addition, I think, to the pollen and nectar that she provided, which is not a great story from the bee standpoint, but it's a pretty amazing strategy from an oil beetle larva standpoint. Uh, and then they, when they become adults, then they feed on flowers like this one is here. Just a, a really amazing set of strategies for this uh, really fascinating little insect. But I want to end with the camouflaged looper, which is my favorite caterpillar. It's a little half inch long uh, inchworm that decorates itself or camouflages itself with the pieces of the flower that it's eating. So here are two different ones feeding on two different kinds of flowers and you can see that they look different because they have different pieces of those different flowers on them. As they're feeding, they'll, they'll reach around and they'll just stick these uh, little bits of flower to their back. There's little hooks on their back and then their saliva is very sticky. If they're on that flower long enough that the, the, the camouflage starts to wilt or dry up, it'll replace it with, with fresher camouflage piece, pieces. And then when it switches to a different kinds of flower, it, it changes out its costume to match the new flower. Just incredible. So to wrap up, we've talked about a wide diversity of species, and that's important because of the redundancy of function that's provided by that diversity, and that leads to this ecological resilience. And species diversity is one of three really key points or key parts of ecological resilience in, in natural systems. The second one is the size of habitats because there's a lot of redundancy in habitat availability within a large patch of habitat. So it's really important to make habitats as large as we can. And then if we can't make them large, if we can at least have them be connected, uh, that also is really important for, for resilience. So the way that translates into strategy is we need to protect the habitat we have, right? Let's, we need to stop breaking up the landscape any more than we have to and, and maintain large connected patches of habitat. And where we have fragmented landscapes, anything we can do to make small patches even just a little bit bigger is really important or even more connected is, is important. And when we do that, we need to use a lot of, of seed species, flower species and, and grass species and sedge species in those diversity, in those restorations, excuse me, uh, for, I mean, just as one example for the pollinators we talked about earlier, right? But it's important for a lot of other things because species diversity makes resilience. And then once we have habitat, management becomes really important. Managing so that they maintain the, the quality of habitat they have for a diverse set of plant and animals of all kinds. So I'm hoping that I can encourage you to pay attention to the small things. Um, including things like ants and other invertebrates that help soils stay healthy, uh, bees and other things that, that pollinate and keep plant species productive, predators that help regulate those. Uh, if you have a chance to do habitat restoration, you know, use as many different species as you can afford to put into a mix uh, from a plant standpoint. And then anything you can do from a management standpoint to promote different types of habitat structure, uh, shift those conditions around the landscape, giving lots of plant species a chance to survive and stay on the landscape. That's all really important. You can do things in your yard uh, using plant diversity, native plant diversity to help out pollinators and lots of other things just in your own backyard or in a place nearby. And you know, help other people, including kids, understand why diversity is important because large animals like bison and others are really important, but it's the little things that really make the world work. So. That's what I have to say. Um, Lori mentioned earlier my books. This is the new book here is The Hidden Prairie. It's, it's a, a fun photograph project that I did where I, I took as many pictures as I could of, of everything I found in one little square meter of prairie throughout the year. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can check out that book. But otherwise, Lori, I'm, I'm done. Wow, bravo. Your pictures are amazing. Um, you. And your talk as well. We have a really good question here, Chris. Can you okay. please comment on the decline in insects and the current die-off of migrating birds in the West? Um, I don't know much about the migrating birds in the West. The insect die-offs are, are uh, I mean, frightening for sure, mostly because we don't really understand what's happening. 
and there's some conflict in the data in terms of what's really happening, uh, which is bad enough, but then again, not understanding what's happening. It's, it's easy to blame things like pesticides, uh, and certainly that has some impacts. Uh, I think most people really feel like it's more about habitat fragmentation. If we wanna save invertebrate communities and pretty much everything else, for the same reasons that I just talked about, you know, saving the habitat, making sure the habitat is diverse and that we're managing it for a lot of different types of vegetation structure is the most important thing we can do. I mean, if we lose our invertebrates, uh, I hope, based on the talk now, you'll understand what some of those ramifications are. Uh, it's a big deal. And I don't know, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to know how to fix that right now, other than focusing on habitat. Right. We've got some other great questions that um, we're gonna come back to after uh, Rick's uh, presentation or talk. Uh, so let me introduce our friend and conservation hero, Rick Hansen. He's a, he's a farmer, he's a conservationist, and he's a representative in the Minnesota legislature. He's dedicated to protecting our environment, and he is our biggest ally on the uh, Environment and Natural Resources Committee. So um, I'll hand it off to you, Rick. Well, thank you. And uh, that was an amazing presentation, Chris. Uh, very enjoyable. And as uh, I was listening and watching uh, and thinking about uh, what we've done, uh, you know, how do we protect these amazing creatures? And as a legislator, uh, we deal with policy. And whether folks want to deal with policy or not, uh, policy happens. And so what we've tried to do is take a diversity of approaches uh, in terms of policy based on science. So our journey in Minnesota started probably at least 10 years ago, uh, looking at pollinator protection. And we've had some successes, uh, some advances, some retreats, um, some changes and some challenges, uh, but we continue to work on the issue and try and innovate uh, several things. So in general, uh, there's the one of the concepts that we hear from uh, the scientists at the Bee Lab that we funded. Uh, as a state, we invested in research. We invested in a facility. We invested in personnel uh, to do research, uh, not only on bees, but other pollinators. And we've continued those investments uh, uh, over the last several years. But we actually have a place that you can go to uh, that is doing research. Uh, is that there is poor habitat, similar to what uh, Chris had mentioned, poor nutrition, parasites, and pesticides. And often on parasites, they may be introduced parasites, uh, invasive species, and pesticides. We have had varying success looking at all of those efforts. We've had more success on habitat and less success on pesticide reform because our, our strong uh, opponents to changing anything with any pesticide law, but we have made some changes. Um, talking about habitat for a little bit, one of the things you can do when you think about your state government or your local government or even your federal government, you have public lands and you have private lands. And often in a state, there will be a division of responsibility. So in Minnesota, we have our Department of Natural Resources that deals with public lands, our parks, our wildlife management areas, um, those public areas, outdoor recreation areas, state forests. Um, prairies, etc. And then you probably have an agency or agencies that deal with private land conservation. Um, and after the Dust Bowl, states often created conservation districts. They may be called soil and water conservation districts. They may be called soil conservation districts. But there's generally some form of local government that then is coordinated at the state level and often partners at the federal level with your Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, in Minnesota, it is the Board of Water and Soil Resources. I could spend the next hour trying to talk about different agencies. We don't want to talk about that. Just know that there's a bunch of people, a bunch of agencies at the state, local, and federal level. Uh, and what you can do with your public lands is you can implement policy because the public lands belong to all of us. So we uh, instituted many years ago 
when we're purchasing property for uh, restoration, whether it's for wildlife or for parkland, is that we implement that there has to be pollinator habitat that's established. And we talk about native pollinator habitat. And we directed our state agencies to direct to develop seed mixes for a variety of ecological reasons. So that regions, excuse me. So using science at every step of the way to recognize the diversity in our state and the diversity of approaches that can be there. Because for private lands, you have to look at a voluntary conservation uh, practice right now um, that you try to incentivize people to implement those practices. So for many years, we have had, for 75 years often, we've had soil and water conservation districts implementing conservation practices on agricultural land. Those may be grass waterways or terraces or buffers. So what we did as legislators, we looked at that precedent because one thing legislators like to look at is the first question is usually comes up is, have we done anything like this before or has any other state done anything like this before? So we looked at existing precedent where we provide financial and technical assistance to, land, assistance to landowners, primarily rural landowners, to implement conservation practices. And we created the Lawns to Legumes program for urban, suburban, and rural metro areas, small towns, sub suburban areas, uh, and in the city. And we did that because the research was also showing that small tracts of land can have a great impact on pollinators. And particularly if you get small tracts of land that uh, can be connected or combined or are enhanced uh, with each other. So we were able, we have a lottery in Minnesota that provides money into an environmental trust fund and we appropriated $900,000 in 2019 uh, to the Lawns to Legumes program for individual homeowners where they could get financial assistance for converting their lawn into pollinator habitat. It's called Lawns to Legumes. You can look up the hashtag, you can search it. It doesn't mean that it's just legum legumes or alfalfa, but it's a pretty good brand if I don't say so myself. So it means native, uh, native plantings, again, which fit best in that area of the state. Uh, we did a press release in the fall of 2018 saying that we would do this if we were elected. Uh, we were elected. Uh, and put in the majority and we passed it and it became law in May of 2019 and the implementation started immediately. And I believe the last count, there have been $4 million of requests from individual uh, urban, suburban and rural landowners who want to participate in that. It also provided the ability to just say, even if you don't want the money that you could get the technical assistance or that it was okay to convert your lawn. So as this is happening, uh, and often challenges when we're dealing with pollinators is our rural cousins may say, what are you doing in the city? Well, now we have an answer. We have the Lawns to Legumes program. We have the programs that are available in the rural areas for agricultural land. We have the public lands. So the public property is being uh, enhanced for pollinators. Private property, we have voluntary uh, incentives. Um, we look at the research uh, for making sure that we have a diversity of mixes, just like Chris mentioned. You want to have strong diversity so that you have that habitat and you have that resilience and you have the nutrition that's available there for the pollinator. I want to mention quickly just parasites and go back to uh, talking about the honeybee, which is uh, an introduced species, but some of the uh, parasitic parasitic research that's been done there is looking at uh, mites and looking at viruses um, that are going on. And how do we impact that? How do we as humans impact that when we're moving um, creatures around? And how do our introduced species maybe have an impact on native uh, pollinators? Minnesota was uh, uh, forthright back in 1916. They actually did a made native bee survey back in 1916. So we have a pretty good baseline of native bees. And so we have funded an update of that survey, again, looking at more science to focus 
not just on honeybees, but looking at the native bees, the native pollinators, and again, that rich diversity of habitat. Um, with pesticides, we, uh, uh, it's often very difficult to change uh, policy related to pesticides at a state level. Often local units of government are preempted from doing things, but I wanna circle back to public property. The city that you live in, the township that you live in, uh, the county that you live in, the school district that you live in, you can help influence decisions about how they use pesticides and how they manage their land. So over the last several years, we've had local units of government where citizens have gone forward and worked with the cities, both local units of government, to implement policies, not necessarily ordinances, but about what they purchase, how they apply, if they're using pesticides, when they use pesticides, and the habitat that they're using on those properties. That's something you can do without changing a state law. And we find when you have local governments lead, state governments will follow. When state governments lead, eventually the federal government will follow. And so we've, we've also tried with some, some, without much success of saying that we should um, limit neonicotinoids on public lands, wildlife management areas. Pass one, one body of the house, but not uh, the, the other body. But we keep trying on it. Sometimes uh, lawns to legumes passed within a year. Uh, some of these things we've tried for several years. Um, sometimes uh, legislation can move in lightning speed, sometimes it's glacial speed, um, but it keeps moving. So we keep trying to do things. I do want to mention um, the rusty patch bumblebee, which is, an, is a federally endangered uh, um, bumblebee. We made that the state bee in Minnesota in 2019. So uh, I don't think any other state has a state bee, and I don't think any other state has the rusty patch bumblebee, but that has helped um, energize people. We also put the lawns to legumes program and modified that to give points to where there is rusty uh, patch bumblebee habitat. And most of the rusty patch bumblebee habitat that survives is in urban areas and in very small tracts of land. So incentivizing homeowners um, and giving incentives for communities where homeowners and neighborhoods can work with each other, where renters can work. Uh, we've also worked in tribal lands because there isn't the, the land ownership. So the tribe is working, uh, one of our tribes is working on implementing pollinator habitat with lawns to legumes as a community effort. If we can get communities to work together, then you have, as Chris mentioned, you have this connected habitat in a very close area. Um, again, continuing to fund research. Whenever we have uh, discussions about this at the legislature, we want to bring in the scientists, we want to bring in the citizens. The lobbyists will always be there. We can tell them because they have the very fine suits on, but it's the citizens and the scientists that we want to make sure that we're listening to and that we have available. And when you do that, you can change things, you can move mountains, uh, and uh, anything is possible. So with that, I think we're about out of time, right? Or do we have well, a little more time? Yeah, thanks, Rick. I'd just like to uh, say that it's really super important, everyone, to vote in your legislators that support the environment, environmental justice and social justice like Rick, because if we didn't have Rick in the Minnesota legislature, we would get probably a third done that we've gotten done with the environment. You really need to have a, um, you need to have a cheerleader in there. And uh, I am just going to, don't go away anybody. I'm just gonna um, share a couple of links which I will send to you in an email where you can look up the voting record on legislatures, legislators in your state. And um, it's very helpful. There's many resources. Um, also, this film, we talked about public lands. It's being launched tomorrow. It's incredible and talks a lot about what's going on behind the scenes um, to protect 
our public lands, which are really under attack right now. So I'm trying to stop my share, but my, there. So um, back to questions. I realize we're out of time, but uh, Chris and I don't know, Rick, if you want to stick around too, but Chris has offered to stick around and answer a few questions here. So do you see this one, Chris, about how small is too small for a mostly functional prairie in terms of, yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, the question is how, it's a, really, it's a really important question, which is what's really, what the question is what's the value of small prairies and, and how big does a prairie have to be to be valuable? And the answer to that is that even a tiny little patch of native flowers is really helpful. Um, so I mentioned in the talk, you know, right at the end about, you know, native, native flowers in a backyard garden can be really important for pollinators, but also just for a lot of other species. And you can do, not only is it important because it helps you and your neighbors look at insects and, and appreciate insects and native flowers, but it really does good conservation. I mean, you can provide resources for a lot of species of native pollinators and other insects just in your backyard. But from a prairie standpoint, uh, I think the key with small prairies is that a couple of things. One, you want to have sort of adjusted expectations, right? In a, in a 10 acre prairie, you're not going to have prairie chickens. Uh, you're probably not going to have a herd of bison, but you will have enough habitat to provide resources for a lot of uh, really important prairie species, including some very rare species that can still survive in a small patch. But there are a couple of big challenges, and they're both just, you know, with, with, with a small prairie, especially if it's isolated from other prairies, if a species disappears from that site, it's unlikely to come back. And because the populations in that, in that small prairie are also small because the area is small, those species are more vulnerable to disappearing if something bad happens, whether that's a drought or a fire or a flood or something, some event or a disease or, or even a predation event. Um, and if that population disappears, it's hard to get it back. From a management standpoint, then one key is to think about not doing something that impacts the entire small prairie at the same time. If you're using fire or mowing, for example, to manage the site, maybe burn or mow half of it or a third of it, um, but leave, leave some refuge out there so that whatever you do, if it has a negative impact on a species, it doesn't impact that species across the whole site. That's a really important thing for small prairies. But, but valuable, and you mentioned in the question, you know, value from an education standpoint, just giving people a place to go, absolutely that's important. Um, people are not gonna be interested in conservation unless they have some sort of way to interact with it or to see that it's important from a very personal standpoint. So providing small areas like that for people to go is, is incredibly important. Great, okay, how about one more question? What is the most interesting insect flower grass seed dispersal relationship you found in the grasslands? Uh, I'm prepared for this one because I saw it there. So let me show you something. I'm gonna share my screen one more time. And we're gonna talk about violets just for a second. So there are a lot of different species of violet. And violets produce seeds in these little pods that are, are sort of droop over and then when they're ripe, they poke themselves up and then they open in three parts. And you can see the rows of seeds here in this, in this photo. As those pods dry, they shrink, they contract, and they basically explosively pop those little seeds out. And those seeds can travel a couple of meters in, in distance, which is impressive enough, but then, if you look at the bottom right photo, you see those seeds, the little white things that look like a little snail or something coming out of there. That's a, it's called an eliosome. It's a little appendage, a little fleshy appendage that is incredibly nutritious for ants. And so some of those seeds fly out of the violet and that's where they end up and then they can grow from there. But others get picked up by ants because of that little eliosome. They get taken back to the ant nest the little white part gets fed to the larvae of the ants, and then the rest of the seed gets thrown in the compost pile, where just coincidentally, it's a great place for violet seeds to germinate. And so violets have two ways of getting their seeds spread out and dispersed across the landscape, and both of them are fascinating, and they can both be used at the same time. So that's, that's one of my favorite seed dispersal stories. <laughs> that's great. Um, okay, well, I think we're gonna wrap it up. I just want to um, 
remind people that this is an ongoing series and we have another webinar coming up September 30th with Don Shelby and Conservation Minnesota. You can register on our website. Um, and if you have questions after this webinar, you can send them to me, Lori, at pollinatorfriendly.org. Uh, this has been a really great webinar. Um, thank you, Chris and Rick. And any, any last comments, Chris or, or Rick? I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Rick? Oops, just a minute, I have to unmute you. Geez, Rick, she didn't mute me. <laughs> I think he has to unmute himself. There you go. I would just encourage everybody to get outside. Uh, you know, with COVID, we have, uh, Many of us have been inside, and Chris had, uh, has talked about all the little things, and the little things are often the most important things. So I'd encourage you to get outside, take a look around, go look under those thistles, um, talk to your neighbors, think about, take a look at your lawn and think about how you could change it, or take a look at your, your fields and look at how you can change it, because oftentimes we can feel powerless during these times, and we have a great amount of power that we can use with our, with our own dollar and, and our own initiative and working together. So get outside and start to work. Well said. Thanks everybody.